Today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, interactive programming with Apache Flink. So uh, before that, a very brief introduction about myself. Um, I used to work at IBM on mainframe uh, for four years and then moved to the United States to continue my master's degree at Carnegie Mellon University and then joined LinkedIn working on Apache Kafka. Last year I came back to China to work for Alibaba and working on Apache Flink. So right now I'm a staff software engineer uh, and a senior manager at Alibaba. And I'm also Apache Kafka PMC and a Flink committer. So, uh, so this is today's agenda. First, we're going to have a very brief look at what is interactive programming. And then we're going to explain why interactive programming uh, is important in Flink. And then we're going to dive a little bit deeper into uh, the implementation and how we're doing it in Flink. And finally, we're going to talk about a little bit uh, about the future work. So uh, first of all, what is interactive programming? It's actually pretty natural to everybody. Almost any of your code is written in the interactive programming way. So here's a code snippet. So I'm getting a value from, uh, I'm getting an integer value, and then I'm looking at that value to see if it's null or not. If it's not null, I'm printing it, and if it's null, I'm throwing an exception. So um, that is interactive programming. So what does that mean? This basically means that the next action that in your program is depending on the result from last computation. So I'm getting a result, um, you know, integer value here, and the next action, depending on what value it is, it's going to be different. So, um, so that's basically interactive programming. And now let's take a look at why interactive programming is important in Flink. So uh, Flink is a stream processing engine uh, in, uh, to begin with, and uh, um, now we're extending our uh, horizon a little bit into the uh, batch processing part. But our API is still kind of you know, streaming-friendly API. So what does that mean? That means the computation is defined on tables or data streams to form a DAG or you know, directional acyclic graph. And then the DAG are submitted and run in one shot into a Flink cluster. Um, and if it's a stream task, it will run forever. If it's a batch task, it will run until all the records are processed. And uh, uh, this is quite suitable for stream processing. We can uh, take a look at this animation. So what a user do is that I'm going to define you know, two sources, and I'm going to join them together, maybe do a filter, and then maybe union it with another data set, and then I'm you know, putting it into a sync. After I form the entire DAG, describe my entire you know, application logic, I'm going to submit this DAG into a Flink cluster. And it either will run forever or run until all the records are processed. But the key point here is that I'm you know, de defining my computation logic upfront as a, as a total you know, DAG. However, when we're coming to the batch processing world, it doesn't you know, uh, look like that. So interactive programming is extremely important for batch processing. And what does that mean? That means DAGs are formed and, and executed you know, step by step. People do not really you know, define the entire processing logic in one single DAG and then submit it and forget it. So uh, what happens is like this. So I might have you know, one simple you know, uh, programming logic here, uh, a few lines of code. And I might submit it to the Flink cluster and get a result back. And then I want to take a look at this result to see you know, what, what the result is. And depending on the result, um, I might say, OK, if it meets some requirement, I'm going to do one thing. Um, and if it doesn't meet this requirement, it goes to another path. I'm submitting yet another DAG. So it's different computation logic, depending on the result that I get from my first step. So as you can see, it's quite different from um, you know, what Flink's uh, uh, current API uh, supports. Uh, and one may say, OK, for Flink, you can also do the same. right? I can, I can describe uh, one DAG here. I submit it once, and it's a batch job. It's going to run until it finishes and come back, and I can submit the other two uh, DAGs afterwards. So let's take a look at an example and see how uh, that works in Flink. So this is a very simple example. I basically have orders 
um, from you know different countries, colors, and each order has also a, a quantity. And then I'm trying to get all the small orders, which means if the quantity is less than 100, it's defined as a small order. And uh, um, so here, um, next, uh, after I get the small orders, I'm going to first uh, group it by country and uh, see you know wh what countries are those small orders from, and I'm printing it out. And after that, uh, I'm just curious about, okay, for those small orders, uh, okay, for those small orders, uh, what is the average quantity by color uh, for the, all the small orders? And printing out the result again here. So as you can see, uh, the small orders table or result is computed here for the first time, and it's used um, twice afterwards. So um, this is a legitimate Flink like program, uh, even even by now. So uh, let's take a look at how exactly it's going to be executed. So what happens is that I'm going to submit the first job, uh, the first job to get the small orders, and then I'm going to submit the second job to uh, get the the countries uh, of the small orders. However, in this in this case, the small orders will actually be recomputed. Even though they have already been computed in my first job, it's going to be recomputed again. And again, for the third time, when I try to look at what's the average quantity of those small orders by color, it's going to recompute job one again. So the small orders actually get computed three times because I used it for three times in my Flink program. So, um, and one way to solve this is basically we say, okay, can we introduce external storage to basically save the result of my first job? That's doable. So what a user can do is that they can submit job and output the, you know, uh, the, the result of the first job, which is small orders, into an external storage. And for my second job, I can read from there and do the process and I, I can write my result. Uh, I, now I don't need to you know, recompute small orders again because it's already saved in an external storage. And for the third job, I can do the same. So the pros of this is that there's no redundant computation anymore. However, as you can see, um, what I need is that I need an external storage. And I also need to explicitly write all the you know, source and syncs to save the intermediate result and to load it back in my later usage. Um, and what we want to do is that we want to do a little bit, a little bit better than that, uh, more user friendly than that. So that's flip 36. So what we want to do is that we want to, you know, cache the result inside Flink cluster instead of putting it outside uh, to some external storage. So what the user can do is that they submit the first job, and the, the intermediate result will be cached inside Flink cluster so the later jobs can just fetch it directly without recomputation. So as you can see here, the, the white subgraph here will not be recomputed, but just be loading from the, um, will just be loaded from the, 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 the cache inside of the Flink cluster. So in this case, uh, you know, all the jobs, they will be run in the same you know, context per se. So everybody will have access to the intermediate result that generated in the previous jobs, as long as they're, in, uh, they're run in the same Flink cluster. And we don't need any external storage anymore. And it typically would have better performance because we do not have external I.O., hopefully, because you know, all the results are cached locally in the, in the Flink cluster, and it's probably saved in local disk. So uh, with, with that change, what, when we look at this program again, we will see, okay, what should be changed? So we actually need to add one more method to our table API, assuming that we're using table API to write this program. So what we need is to add a cache method here. So after we compute the small orders, we can just call small orders dot cache. And that will essentially tell uh, Flink, when you, after you compute small orders, uh, please save it in, uh, in, the, in the Flink cluster. Do not delete it after the job finishes, because I'm going to use it for later usage. And after that, the two usage afterwards uh, on small orders will not be computing small orders again. They will just use the cached, re the cached result. 
So, um, so as you can see, um, interactive programming is actually important for batch processing. And uh, um, the way it works is that we allow users to execute the program step by step without introducing recomputation all the time. And the key to interactive programming here at runtime is actually intermediate result caching. So then the next question is that how exactly we're going to do that? How exactly we're going to you know, save the intermediate result and find it back uh, when, we, when we try to use it later? So here's, the, um, here's what we do. So um, as you can see, this is like a, a, a very simple like one-line program. So we have two sources. We'll, I will call A join B, uh, and uh, where you know, column one equals to column two and I'm going to select column three in this case, and then I call dot cache. So what essentially happens is that uh, um, we define all the intermediate result as uh, you know, all the tables before the sync. So here we can say the, the, the result in, uh, of join and select, they're both intermediate result. Um, and we also will assign each intermediate result a unique identifier. We call it intermediate result ID or IRID. Um, and one thing important here is that when we call dot cache after the select uh, node here, we will change this edge um, into a, a something called blocking persistent. So what does blocking persistent mean? This basically means the result partitions are not going to be deleted uh, after the job finishes. So this is like a flag we set on the result. So when, when this job finishes, the, the Flink task manager won't remove the result uh, that has already been computed. So when we submit this DAG into the Flink cluster to run, what happens is that the Flink cluster, when it sees the task manager, when it sees the, you know, the, uh, the blocking persistent edge here, what it does is that it will write the result into the shuffle service, and then it write, it write the result to the sync. So the, the, the intermediate result is actually persisted in the shuffle service. And um, once the job finishes, the job master will return the result to the client uh, by telling it, OK, this is the intermediate result ID 1, and here's its location. We need this location because when the later job comes, uh, the client will actually um, do something, so it, it needs to re, you know, rebuild this edge so it knows where to read the intermediate result from. So, um, yeah, so when a later job comes, let's say, and it will essentially try to you know, uh, compute the same subgraph here, which we have already cached, so we know that the, the output of select uh, node here is intermediate result uh, ID 1. And we're going to do a lookup in the client and see whether it's actually been cached or not. If it's already been cached, instead of submit the entire graph to the runtime, we're going to replace this, play, uh, replace this uh, subgraph to nothing and simply you know, adding an, a, a, an edge to this filter uh, node. So we replace the input of the filter node to include the location here. And that becomes a location to you know from the like uh, service uh, from the shuffle service which has a result there, and then we are going to submit this graph to the runtime, and task manager will simply execute this graph by reading from the shuffle service instead of reading from uh, instead of reading from external storage or you know recompute the entire uh, subgraph. So what about failure recovery? What, what if, you know, uh, for whatever reason, the cached result in the shuffle service uh, is lost? So uh, if the task manager fails, what, what would happen? In our case, the intermediate result cache is allowed to be missed in the task manager. So uh, in this case, the client will apparently uh, fail, to found the, fail to find the intermediate result. So what it will have is that it will receive an exception from the runtime saying that, OK, I, do, I cannot find the intermediate result. So in this case, uh, the client will essentially delete the entry of the intermediate result from its like, lookup table. Um, like, so here, it will delete this entry from the lookup table. 
And then uh, it will resubmit the job again with the entire uh, you know, uh, graph, which means it will, it will just submit this entire graph. And in this case, um, the intermediate result that is supposed to be cached will be reviewed and will be cached again. So, um, and that's basically uh, what we're proposing in FLIP 36. And uh, uh, we're trying to address, um, you know, the, the use cases from batch processing. Um, and it's also very useful for people who are, you know, in the machine learning world to do some ad hoc queries and to do some experiments. Uh, and what's our future work? So there are a few future works. One thing is that, as you can see, the current Flip 36, or the, the thing that we described, it only works with, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, with in-session intermediate result sharing, which means that if I have two jobs, they want to share the same intermediate result, they have to be submitted into the same Flink cluster. So they kind of have to be in the same session, per se. Um, and we want to be able to do cross-session intermediate result sharing as well. So basically, if I have an application, submit a, a job, and uh, um, I cache some result there, I have another application running later. I want to be able to use or reuse the intermediate result that has already been computed by my previous application. Um, and also, uh, right now, we only support like manual caching, which means that a user have to call uh, table.cache in order to save your intermediate result. Um, but we actually could do auto caching at the shuffle boundaries because we're essentially using the shuffle service to save the intermediate results. So what we can do is that uh, after the shuffle, we can just you know, do not delete the, the intermediate result that has already been saved in the shuffle service. Uh, and we keep it as long as possible. So potentially later on, if there's the same sub DAG uh, submitted, we can, we can just use it. Um, so this is like the um, uh, functionality-wise feature. And we also want to add more you know, um, methods to the table API. Because right now, there's no way for you to get the content of a table uh, from our table API. You have to submit a job, then you can process the data in the table. And uh, uh, we might add something like table.collect, which allow you to get the result or get the content of the table into your main program. So you can you know, do some if-else stuff. Cool. Uh, yeah, and uh, that's uh, my talk for the interactive programming. All right. Thanks. Yeah, just a tiny question um, for the for the cache function. Um, mm -hmm. uh, will you also provide a possibility to choose which uh, intermediate result ID you use, so you can refer uh, from other sessions or the like? to these intermediate results. You know, as I understand currently, the mm -hmm. system chooses the ID and it never surfaces. Uh, that's right, yes. Well, you can think of, of it as this way. So uh, the users will always call uh, dog cache uh, from a table, right? You have a table and that table apparently has a variable name or whatever thing in your program. So you will call table dog cache. And that table itself is essentially you know, the user recognized ID. So you can whatever, if you want to reuse the result, you pass the table around, and that's how it works. So uh, it, it, does that answer your question? So you, OK. And you, you're, trying to, you're trying to assign a name or an ID, uh, like a custom ID, to the intermediate result. Is that what you're trying to do? Yeah, it, it's like uh, when we go across session, mm -hmm. Ah, uh, yes. OK. Got it. Got it. Yeah, you're right. Yes. If it's cross session, then some kind of custom ID would be required. Yes. Yeah. What's the um, behavior if the intermediate result doesn't fit into the cache? It's too large. Uh, OK, so you're saying that what if the intermediate result is missing, right? No, no, if the, if the output, that intermediate uh -huh. result, is too large to fit into the cache. Ah, OK, OK. So uh, that's a great question. So uh, technically speaking, it's, it's, it, it, it's, kind of, it's possible, but uh, it, it, it would be very unfortunate because that pretty much means uh, if it happens to be an actual shuffle boundary, your program will fail. 
Right, because we're using the shuffle service, it's possible that you know, uh, your intermediate result is so large and the, you know, the, the, the entire Flink cluster cannot hold it. Um, and uh, because we're already you know, putting it into the disk, so if, if your disk cannot host it, then that simply means your Flink cluster is not big enough to run your program. You need to scale up. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Hi. Uh, is there a possible connection between this and the catalog? Like m maybe uh, saving a table? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I think yes, uh, absolutely. So uh, especially for, uh, for cross-session sharing, uh, you probably want to have like an external catalog so you can save your intermediate result to the external catalog uh, with its location. So later on, another application can go to the catalog and get whatever intermediate result has already been generated in this application. Um, but right now, we don't, we, don't see the uh, we don't see the necessity of doing that when you have the, like the in-session sharing. But if you're doing cross-session sharing, that would be very useful, yes. Okay. Thanks again. Great presentation, Becca. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.